Let's give a round of applause to our amazing worship team today. Thank you for leading us so beautifully. Thank you, thank you. And uh, you guys can take your seats. So good to be with you on this rainy Sunday. It was beautiful yesterday, though, wasn't it? Like the weather was just stunning. It was so, so beautiful. And I don't know how I'm going to follow a pterodactyl. Like I'm feeling the pressure now with that amazing pterodactyl <laughs> that came out. But, uh, but I'm just believing that God's going to speak to us, that you've come. You're not in this room by accident, that God has you here um, for a reason and purpose, and that he wants to speak to your heart today. And also for those joining, you on, uh, joining us online, welcome. Uh, welcome to you. And uh, we are basically at the end of a four-part series. We have been looking at a series on our purpose and calling, and we've been investigating different aspects of what it means to follow Jesus and be set apart for his purposes and plans. Pastor Julie spoke an incredible message about being a kingdom of priests, and then we had Pastor Damien speak to us about being passionate disciples. And then last week, Pastor John talked to us around the idea of being faithful stewards. And today, we're going to finish off the series looking at one additional part of our walk of faith as believers that plays a key role in our purpose and calling. And so before we dive into the word, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your presence that's here. I thank you that you want to speak to us. You're a God who is alive. You are speaking. Um, and I just pray that we have ears to hear what you want to say. And I pray, God, that we would leave this place changed, knowing you more, loving you more, because we've heard your word. And we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're going to start uh, with a question. And this is my question for you. If you could use one word or one phrase to identify yourself, to describe who you are, what would it be? What's the first thing that comes to your mind to describe who you are as a person? Some people might answer that question and they might think the first thing that comes to their mind is their nationality or their ethnicity. They might say something like, I'm Canadian or I'm Korean or I'm South African. Or maybe for you, the first thing that came to your mind when you're thinking about who you are is your occupation. You might think, well, you know, I'm an accountant or I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a graphic designer. Or maybe it's your role in the family. You think, well, I, when I first think about myself, I think, well, I'm a mom or a wife or a husband or, or a daughter or a son. Or maybe for you, the first thing you thought about was something related to your faith. The first thought that comes to your mind is, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm loved by God. In the world we live in, there's so many different facets of someone's identity, ways of understanding ourselves in relation to other people, to God, to the world around us. But I am guessing that nobody in this room, the first thought that came to your mind was this word. And it's the word servant. Was that anyone's first word that came to their mind? Come and meet me afterward. You should preach this message if that was, that was your first word. I'm guessing most of you did not think of the word servant as the first word to describe your identity. And when you hear that word, it might even conjure up like a negative connotation. You might think, well, servant, that kind of sounds, you know, like Cinderella sweeping the whole house while being mistreated by her wicked stepmother. Or you might think of some like 16th century peasant in tattered clothes, bowing down to an ungrateful, overbearing king. But in the Bible, being a servant is a high and noble calling. And it's one of the markers of our identity as Christians. As followers of Jesus, we are called servants of Christ. In fact, the word servant in the Bible is a translation of the Greek word doulos. And more literally, this word means a slave or a bond servant. Someone who sets aside their own rights and freedoms to serve someone else. Now, you may balk at that and go, a servant? Like, I don't like the sound of that. A slave? Like, that sounds awful. That has a lot of negative connotation when I think about that word. You might think, like, I'm, I'm good with my identity being a Christian or a child of God, but a servant? A slave? Isn't that a bit extreme? One important distinction that we're going to have to make from the beginning is we're not talking about a servant or a slave in the context of someone who's oppressed or mistreated or first forced to work against their will. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. Forcefully oppressing anyone is wrong, and that's not the heart of God. That is clear in Scripture. Let's establish that. 
But when the word doulos or bondservant is used, it's actually a reference to a law that's set up in Exodus. And if there was a situation where someone could not pay their debts, they would act for a period of six years. And then in the seventh year, their debt was canceled, and they were given a choice to go free. And this system actually acted as a way of protection. It handled issues of indebtedness and poverty in biblical times. And some servants actually loved the family they were with so much that in that seventh year, they decided to stay with them. That was actually a choice that was given to them. And if they chose to stay, they would be that. Then the parallel is drawn in the New Testament, and it's that we are indebted to Christ, right? Jesus paid a price. We could not pay the penalty for our sin. He did it. And listen, we don't serve him to pay back our debt because we never could. We never could pay back that debt. But out of our love and gratitude for him paying off our debt, we choose to willingly and freely serve him for the rest of our lives. We choose, to, we choose him to be our Lord and master for life. And we actually see several references in the New Testament to people identifying themselves as servants of Christ, taking on that identity. If you look at the letters of Paul or James or Jude or Peter, they start letters referring to themselves as servants of Christ. For example, in Romans 1.1, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church in Rome, and he starts off his letter with this. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. I want you to think about that. Paul could have chosen any adjective or title to describe himself at the beginning of his letter. He could have said, Paul, a child of God. Paul, a preacher of God's word. Paul, the dude who was struck down with blindness on the road to Damascus. I mean, any of those would have been fine and accurate. But we see here in the book of Romans, he chooses to identify himself at the beginning of his letter as a bond servant, a servant of Christ. And he viewed himself through the lens of being a servant of Christ, ready and willing to do whatever, whatever God asked of him. And if you look at Paul's letters, he most regularly starts his letter by identifying himself either as an apostle or a bondservant or some kind of combination of both. And we also see God's people in the New Testament being encouraged to be servants of Christ. For example, Paul exhorts Timothy, his protege, to be a worthy servant of Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus himself used the concept of a servant to describe those who follow God and choose to make him their master. He says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. He's talking about money in this context. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And it's not just a new covenant idea, this idea of being God's servant. We see it if you go back into the Old Testament. Look in the book of Numbers, and Moses is referred to as a faithful servant who speaks to God face to face. And we see in Psalms, King David referred to himself as the Lord's servant. And throughout the generations recorded in the Bible, the people of God are called God's servants. So if that is the core part of our identity as followers of Jesus, what does it mean then to be a servant of Christ? Like, what does that mean? What does it look like? And simply put, it means to follow the call to live for Christ and to die to self. We are giving up our rights to live the way we want to. We are saying Jesus is the Lord of our lives and we live to please him. Now, that is quite radical in the world we live in. And it was radical at Jesus' time. It's very countercultural. It goes against the grain of what the majority of people on earth are doing and thinking. I want you to consider the stark contrast. The world would say, live your best life. Whatever you want to do with it, just go. Whatever feels good. Go do that. Live for yourself. You deserve it. That's what the world would say to you. But listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 16, starting in verse 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return? For his soul. I want you to think about that contrast again. Let it sink in. The world says, live for yourself. Jesus says, die to yourself. The world says, follow whatever feels good. Jesus says, take up your cross 
and follow me. The world says, take hold of all you can possess. Get everything. Jesus says, surrender everything to me. Surrender your life and all you have to me. You can't get much more opposite than that, right? And you can see why Jesus said the path of following him is a narrow road. It is the best and most blessed path you will ever walk along. But it also requires humility. It requires sacrifice and surrender. We are called to be humble servants who submit to the will of God in a world that glorifies self-promotion and self-actualization. And that's not easy. That is not easy. And so I want to talk about how we go about that. Like, how do we live out this high calling to be humble servants of Christ? And really, it requires an attitude shift. It starts with evaluating the posture of our heart. And if we're focused on ourselves and our rights and our own selfishness, we are going to miss this high calling. But if we are willing to humble ourselves and bow to the will of the King of Kings, we are going to enter more fully into the privilege. It's a privilege of being called Christ's servants. So today, we're going to be looking at three attitudes or heart postures that characterize a servant in God's kingdom. And truly, for each one of these attitudes, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us each day and empower us by his grace to live out this calling. In our own strength, we can't do it, <laughs> but with God, we can. And as the Holy Spirit, who is called in scriptures, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth, he's at work in our hearts. He helps reshape the posture of our hearts. And as our heart posture shifts to take on these attitudes more and more, we become more like Jesus Christ, who was a servant himself. And so if you're taking notes, the title of this message is called to serve. And we are going to take a look at the first attitude of a servant. Are you with me, church? Are you awake? All right, awesome. The first one is this. A servant puts others before themselves. A servant puts others before themselves. During the week, I am a grade two teacher. That is, that's what I do. That's my day job. And uh, I will be honest, in all my years of teaching, I have to say that pretty much what I have noticed is the natural inclination of a seven-year-old is to get their own way and to put themselves first. <laughs> okay, there can be arguments about who's first in line. That's always very important. Who is first in line? Who butted who? That's always an argument that happens. There can be quarrels over sharing supplies and personal space. And heaven forbid, in the winter time when they're building snow forts, it becomes territorial. If you take a boulder, if you go into someone else's space, there it's it's not good news, right? The idea of setting down what you want and putting someone before you is not, not really their first thought. We have something at my school called random acts of kindness. And so kids can get nominated and um, they basically get in front of the school, they uh, get kind of awarded for, for, being, for doing something awesome in front of someone else. They get, they get recognized for doing something really kind for someone else. But what I find hilarious is that sometimes kids will be doing something and then they'll look to see if you notice. Like, they'll be helping a friend, and then, and then sometimes they're very obvious about it. Like, they'll help a friend, and they're like, did you see that? Like, I just helped my friend pick up their pencil. And they want to be nominated. But the point is, you're not doing it, right? You're doing it out of the goodness of your heart, not to be recognized, right? But that definitely happens. Now, I would love to say that after the age of seven or even after childhood, people outgrow the instinct to put themselves first and to look out for their own needs. But I will tell you, it does not. And how do I know this? Because I'm selfish, and I need the Lord. And I'm sure we've all found ourselves at times that tendency to put ourselves first, to focus on ourselves. You know, you fight to get that parking spot. You cut someone else off in traffic because where you need to go is way more important in your mind. You interrupt or you talk over people because you think what you have to say is more important. Maybe there's drama at work because people are fighting to get noticed or get their promotion, and there's jealousy and there's backstabbing. But as servants in God's kingdom, we are called to put Jesus first. One of the acronyms we talk about at my school is joy, Jesus, others, and you. So you put Jesus first, right? Jesus first, he's the one you serve, you glorify him. Then the O is others, you, from the overflow of your love for him, you serve other people. And then you put you last, and it spells joy. Now, does that mean that you neglect yourself and never take care of yourself? No, that's not what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying. I'm just saying we need to fight that sin nature that wants to always make sure that we are first and we are on top and we get what we want. 
Now, if you want to look at an example of a true servant who put others first, I mean, look to Jesus. <laughs> okay, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, listen to this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. He did not use that to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The amazing thing is that when we're called to be servants, we're not called to do anything that God himself would not do. God is not this big meanie in the sky demanding that we serve him. He is a loving, kind, humble servant king. He set for us the example of what it means to sacrificially serve other people. In fact, in scripture, Jesus is referred to as the suffering servant. Jesus is God. I mean, he, again, he can do whatever he wants to do. But he chose to humble himself, to put on human flesh, serve even those he knew would reject him. He served humanity to the point of giving up his very life. And Jesus showed us what it looks like to put others first in John 13. We find the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feast, uh, feet at a feast. Feet at a feast. At the Passover meal, Jesus took off his, his outer clothes, his robe. He poured water into a basin and washed his disciples' feet with a towel that was wrapped around him. And in those days, okay, people didn't have socks and sneakers on. I mean, it gets stinky enough with socks and sneakers, doesn't it? But, like, imagine people, sandals, there's dust and dirt and, like, animal dung that they're walking through on the streets, right? Their feet would have been super smelly and filthy, and in that culture, the person who washed the feet of another as they entered a home would have been considered a very low-ranked servant. It was not a role that someone would willingly sign up to do. And when Jesus started washing their feet, Peter, the disciple Peter, he objected. He's like, the God of the universe, the Messiah, bending down to wash the filth off our feet, taking the role of a lowly servant. No way. That's not fitting for the king of kings. Pardon me. And yet we see Jesus teach an important lesson through this selfless act of love. In John 13, starting in verses 12 to 17, it says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, in his outer clothes, and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, so for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus is saying, look, I'm God. I've set an example for you to serve others. If the master of the whole universe, the one who created the sun, the stars, the planet, everything that exists... If he would bend down on his knees and wash the filthy, smelly feet, we as servants have no excuse not to serve with the same heart. We are called to hum be humble and serve other people. And as servants of Christ, we need to follow his example. We are called to serve others even, even when the task may not seem appealing. Which actually brings us to the second heart attitude, and it's this. A servant is faithful with whatever task is placed in their hand. Faithful with whatever task is placed in their hand. When I was thinking about this point, I was, I was reminded of when I was a Bible college student at, at Hillsong College. And at that time when you're in Bible college, they sign you up to serve in, in different areas. And for about a year and a half, I served on the hosting team. Thursday mornings, we would have sisterhood, actually. I know at our church, we have it a few times a year. And at uh, Hillsong in Australia, they would have it every Thursday morning. I believe they still do. Yeah, every Thursday morning. And anyway, I'd be serving on the, the hosting team. And I remember this one morning, I was just in a mood. Like, I didn't want to be on the hosting team. I didn't want to serve. I didn't want to put out seat drops. I wanted to sleep in. And I didn't want to come and help. And I remember putting out the seat drops on the seat, and the worship team's rehearsing as I'm doing it. And I just have an attitude in my heart. And I'm like, but God, I'm seeing the people singing. I'm like, but God, I want to do that. Like, I don't feel like putting out seat drops on seats. I want to sing. I feel like you've called me to sing. Why aren't I doing that? 
And I felt like God say, but what have I put in your hand to do right now? What have I put in your hand to do right now? And, you know, the Lord had to teach me just to be faithful with what he calls me to do. He's still teaching me that. <laughs> Every day he's teaching me that. But just to be faithful with what he puts in my hands, even if it, it's not my favorite thing, even if it doesn't appeal to me. You know, can I be faithful to serve the Lord for the rest of my life, even if it's a task that doesn't match what I'd prefer? And, you know, fast forward to 2018, and Hillsong Canada launches. And at that time in 2018, I'm helping oversee the singers at our church. So God actually eventually put me in a position where I was singing and using that gifting and then overseeing the, the vocalists at our church. And as you can imagine, when we launched as Hillsong Canada, there were a lot of people interested in singing, a lot of people interested in being on the worship team. And so we held auditions. And I just felt this weight of responsibility, like, oh, I've got to listen to all these people sing. And, and singing, when you're doing an audition, if you've ever done one, like, it's quite vulnerable, and you want to do your best. And, you know, people have a heart. They want to serve and, and be on team. But we had lots of people audition. I probably auditioned upwards of 60 people, um, you know, over the course of when we first launched as, as Hillsong Canada. And my heart was really, and our, our heart as a church was just to get people serving. Like, are you just willing to serve wherever? Um, we placed you because the reality is I couldn't, even though I wanted to with all my heart, I couldn't put 50 or 60 new people up on platform right away, right? That's just like the logistics of that would not work. So we were just asking people, are you, can you serve in this area? Could you run lyrics? Could you put the lyrics on the screen? Could you help uh, with audio? Could you help, you know, uh, could you help even in kids? Like anywhere that you can help, we would love your help. Just get involved, just get served in church. And I didn't ask for permission to share this, but I actually want to give a shout out to Danae, who is singing today on, on platform over here. I don't know where she is right now, but she's somewhere. Oh, she's up there. Hi, Danae. Uh, I remember her auditioning with me. It would have been like probably early 2019, I think. She has a beautiful voice, right? But at that time, we had enough vocalists on platform, and we needed people serving elsewhere. And so I just said, hey, can you help with lyrics? Can you do that? And she's like, absolutely. So she started serving on lyrics and was faithful doing that. And then she, we needed surf service operators, so she started doing that. And then we needed connect group leaders, and she started doing that. And I would say there was a good couple years where she didn't sing. She had audition, but she didn't sing until finally there was a time. I was like, wow, we, we actually need more singers right now. Danae, are you available? And then she stepped in, and she's been awesome, and then she's faithful with singing and showing up for her roster and just bringing her beautiful gift to the church. And then we're like, do you want to lead worship? And then she started to lead worship. And what I love about Danae is that she was just faithful with what was in her hand. She didn't have an agenda. She just came, and she wanted to serve. And she was, you know, faithful, and she just thought, you know, you know, I'm not an obstacle for her getting where God wants her to be, right? God's able to get people where he needs them and put them in position, but, um, but I just love her heart, and I love seeing her doing what she's doing today, right? And maybe for you, it's not even, like, you don't have a desire to do anything on platform. Like, maybe for you, like, I would absolutely hate singing. <laughs> I would hate speaking. I'd hate anything up here. Like, never, ever, I would want to do that. But wherever you're serving, you know, like, on your team at church, would you be faithful? Like, if your leader asked you to take on more responsibility, would you be like, you know what? I'm going to try doing that, Right? And maybe even for work, maybe you're happy where you're serving on team at church and you show up and you're cheerful and you're excited, but maybe it's something at work that's in your hands right now and you go, God, I don't want this task at work. Like, I hate this. And God's saying, be faithful with what is in your hand right now. You know, last week, Pastor John, he read from the parable of the talents and spoke about being good stewards. And the workers did not have say over how many talents they were given, but they did have control over what they did with those talents, right? And to, be, to the faithful workers, God says this in Matthew 25, 23. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Are we willing to take how, whatever God places in our hands and be thankful and be a good steward with that opportunity? Because you know what? I even think sometimes big C church around the world, we can put way too much emphasis on this even, like the whole platform thing, right? And I'm always humbled, honestly, by per people like Lock and Load team. You guys are incredible. You come early. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause, honestly. They come early. They're, they're the first here. They're the last to leave. That's commitment. I'm humbled by that. I'm humbled by the people who serve in kids. We don't even see them. I mean, they're downstairs. They're over at 901 Young. 
and they're serving the kids, raising the next generation of leaders. You know, I'm humbled by the Next Steps team. They call during the week to follow up with people who are new to church. People, I love the people who greet at the door, rain or shine, when it's cold, when it's hot. They're just out there. I mean, that's amazing. And all the other teams, too. I mean, I could list them all. Just amazing. This does not mean imp more important, right? It's just another, and I'm not, it's another area to serve. And some people are called with their talents to be here. But I actually, I was humbled one one day when I was listening to Christine Kane's speech, because, uh, speak, because God has positioned me here for this time for, for whatever reason. Um, but Christine Kane was speaking, and she was talking about 1 Corinthians 12 and the different parts of the body, right? And she said, I want you to think about it. The parts of the body that are not seen are actually the vital parts, the brain and the heart. The things you can't see are actually what are causing your body to function. You could live without an arm. You could live without you know, your leg if you needed to. But the parts that are inside are vital. And so I think I wouldn't even be able to speak up here today if it wasn't for the stuff happening behind the scenes, the person at the camera, the person greeting at the door, all of us together building, building the church of God. I love what Oswald Chambers says in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. He says, readiness for God means that we are prepared to do the smallest thing or the largest thing. It makes no difference. It means we have no choice in what we want to do, right? We take what God gives us. But that whatever God's plans may be, we are ready, we are there. Whenever any duty presents itself, we hear God's voice as our Lord heard his Father's voice. And we are ready for it with a total readiness of our love for him. Are we ready? Are we willing? Will we be servant-hearted and humble no matter what task God places in our hands? So, church, we want to put others first. We want to be faithful with God, what God's placed in our hands. And this is the final point. A servant is concerned with exalting God and not themselves. They're concerned with exalting God and not themselves. There's a story in the gospel of two disciples who were brothers, and they had a special request for Jesus. Their request revealed the attitude of their heart that needed to be changed. They wanted position and status in the kingdom of God. Listen to this. It's a request of James and John and Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 35. It says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptiz baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. <laughs> Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want you to think about that again. I mean, this is a common theme in what we're talking about. It's so opposite of the world we live in, isn't it? In our world, to be first really means first. Like, I got to be number one, and then I'm best, right? Or to be great means that you're the boss, and people have to do what you say, and you're the one who's on top. But Jesus calls us to a different way, to be first Put yourself last. To be great, bend low. Don't seek your own honor, but look for ways to honor other people. And, you know, unfortunately, some try to, you know, use God for their own self-actualization. You know, I'll follow God if I get what I want. But true servants do not have an agenda. I want you to hear that again. True servants do not have an agenda. They serve out of love and a longing to honor God, not for prestige and platform and accolades. Rick Warren in his book, Purpose Driven Life, says, Real servants don't try to use God for their purposes. They let God use them for his purposes. And it's a great ask, question to ask yourself. You know, am I using God to get what I want in life? Or am I allowing God to have his way in my life? I, uh, I enjoy reading uh, biographies. And I read one a few years ago about an awesome man named Eric Little. I don't know if you've heard about him, but uh, maybe you've heard of the movie Chariots of Fire. Have you heard of that movie? And uh, basically, he was this awesome guy. He was born in 1902, incredible athlete, okay? And he was in the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris. And he was the best at the 100-meter race. But 
in that Olympic game, that particular race was scheduled for a Sunday, and Eric was a Christian. He had a strong conviction that he wanted to reserve that day for the Lord. That was his personal conviction. And so he said no to running in that race, even though he was a sh like he would for sure win. And so he created a lot of stir about that decision, and he actually decided to race in the 200 and 400 meter that were scheduled for other days in the Olympics. And against all odds, he ended up miraculously winning gold in the 400 meter, and he also placed third in the 200 meter. And he had a lot of fame and notoriety, but listen to this, at the height of his fame, he told everyone he was leaving athletics to pursue missions work. And he headed to China to serve in a missions organization, and this shocked people. They thought like, here's this man, incredible Olympic gold medalist, at the height of his athletic career, and he's leaving it to do what? To go live in obscurity in China and serve people there? It didn't make sense. He had fame, he had glory, he had the attention of multitudes of people. But from his life story, we can see a man who simply was using his gifts to bless God's heart, not to promote himself. He used his platform that God gave him to point people to Christ. And it's so opposite of what the world says and how people try and promote themselves. In Psalm 115, 1, it says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and your faithfulness. Church, we are called to be servants of Christ. That's our identity. It's the core of our purpose and calling as followers of Jesus Christ. And the truth is, listen to this, none of us graduate from serving. None of us. It's not like you get to the point in your life where you get promoted out of serving and then you get served all the time. It doesn't happen, okay? In the kingdom of God, we are called to serve one another with the gifts and talents God has given us. From the overflow of that revelation of that identity, we, that we are servants of Christ, then we become more like Jesus. We put others first. We serve faithfully with whatever task is in our hand. We exalt God and not ourselves. And so what does that look like? Like, what are some practical next steps? If that is your identity and you want to live from that place of being like, okay, God, this is, this is hard. But I want to live from that place of, of serving you, serving your people. Well, you know what? It's team month. This team up, maybe for you it looks like signing up for a team at church and just saying, hey, I don't even know where to get started. Maybe for you, you're like, I don't even know where to serve. Just go and talk to someone, next step stand, and we can get you plugged in and get you serving somewhere. Maybe for you, you're already on a team, but maybe your team lead is asking you to step out and take on more responsibility. Or maybe, you know, you get out of your comfort zone and you say, yeah, I'm going to serve people. I'm going to do that. Maybe it looks like opening up your home and showing hospitality and, hoping, and hosting a connect group. Maybe it uh, you know, means taking on a task at work that no one else wants to do, but you're willing to do it. Maybe this week it means going out of your way to serve your spouse or your family in a way that you know would bless them, even though it's really inconvenient for you. There are many ways we can live out this calling to serve God and serve others. We are called to be servants of Christ, and may the posture of our heart Always be that of a humble servant, just like Jesus. Let's encourage one another to live out this holy calling to follow the example of Jesus. Church, would you stand with me in this moment? I want to I just talk to us about what it means even to follow Jesus. Because you to serve actually means you need a master. <laughs> to be a servant, servants need a master. And the master of the universe, God is the most humble, gentle, kind, loving, faithful master you could ever serve. And so if you want to get to that place of like, you know what? I want him to be Lord of my life. I don't want to just, you know, come to church or read my Bible sometimes. Like I, I want him to be Lord. There's a difference. He is Lord. He calls the shots. And he always leads you into what's good. You can trust him. He always leads you to what good, what's good and best for you. But it does take a decision. It takes that moment where you say, God, I don't want to lead myself anymore. I want to be led by you. I want to be led by your Holy Spirit. I want to give my life to you. And maybe you don't even know where to start. Maybe you're in this room and you think, I've got nothing to bring. I've got nothing to bring. I've got no gifts and talents. You know what? Like, actually, Brian was talking about this today. What do we bring? A repentant and contrite heart. 
we just bring that to God. That's our offering. God, here's my heart. Take it. Have my heart. Have my whole life. And you'll be amazed at the things that God places in your hands to do. You'll be amazed at the gifts and talents that he's actually put inside of you that you don't even know are there. And that he'll bring to the surface and give you opportunity to use it to bless his name and bless people around you. So I want to give those watching online at home and those of you in this room an opportunity to make that choice and say, Lord, I want you to be Lord. I want to serve you. I want to be humble. I don't want to live for myself anymore. It doesn't feel good. It feels empty. It's purposeless. I want to live for you. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed just for privacy, I want to give you that chance, that opportunity. And if that's you, just with an act of faith, would you lift your hand? to the Lord and just say, hey, like I want to serve you, God. I'm tired of trying to live my life on my own. I want to surrender my life to you. You're good. You're a good God. And I trust you. Yeah, thank you for raising your hand. You can keep it raised. And it's just reaching out to God. That's why we raise our hands. And we're all going to pray this prayer together. And it's a prayer that says, Jesus, you're going to be Lord of my heart all the days of my life. I trust you. I surrender to you. And so come on, church. Let's say this together. Dear Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for your amazing love. I turn away from my sins and ask for your forgiveness. Please come into my life and give me a fresh start. I trust you and submit to you as my Lord and Savior. I am now a Christian, a child of God a servant of Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ. Help me live my life for you from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Can we give a round of applause to everyone who made that decision? That's so awesome. Salvation is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. You become a new creation. The old is gone, and he does something new within you. So exciting. I love what God's done in this room today. And I hope that word blessed you and that we as a church can move forward, that we would serve one another in love, in humility. And just imagine what God can do in this church and in this place. Um, Brian's going to close us out and give us some next steps for um, what we can do next if you made that decision. Thanks, church. Thank you. Come on, church. Give a big hand for Laura and that word. What an incredible word. I hope that blessed you. I'm sure it did. I hope you took a lot of notes because it was a very, very great and impactful word. And you can take it throughout your week. You know, we're called to serve. So I hope you really, really enjoyed it. Well, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, I have this Bible here. And um, we want to give this as a free gift from us to you. And it's just, obviously, we believe this is the living word of God. And it can help you in your everyday walk. And we have a few team members around the room. We have someone at the back over here with the Bible pickup sign, and you can pick one of these up. It's a free gift from us to you, so make sure you do that. Um, and yeah, we'd love to give this to you. So our team will talk to you at the Bible pickups. Well, are you feeling good still? Was it a good day? All right, all right. Well, I want to encourage you. Like we talked about team, we're going to have teams on the side over here in our welcome lounge. Go say hi to them, and if you want to join a team, We'd love for you to connect with them. And if you want to find out more information, do that as well. It's going to be really, really great for us to chat with you and for you to meet the team as well. So let's pray together, church, and let's let you go on your way. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you because you are a good God. We thank you, Lord God, because we know that you are with us throughout this week. You're going to be with us. And we just trust, Lord God, that the word that was sown into us today, Lord God, we may use it for your glory, Lord. So in your holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you, church. Have an amazing day. See you at the Welcome Lounge. Let's worship one more time.